All right, and we're uh, comp one, two, three, and it's uh, week three, lesson three, part four. Part four. And we just finished talking about constructor and constructor initializers, which I told you guys was probably some uh, a pattern uh, or a construct, if you will, right, that is, I don't see a lot, right? Again, let's talk about what they are again, if you see what it says. It says, a clause that indicates another instance of a class constructor should be executed before any statements in the current constructor body, right? Again, very ambiguous way of saying this. Basically what it is is saying, let's initialize the properties before we kick off the constructor, right? Um, if I use the read-only modifier in a constructor, right, they're like named constants, right? Let's take a look at what they look like. Um, give some examples here of what it looks like. So here's a class employee, right? And, oops, let's go back. I have this static, here's my, uh, uh, my demo object initializer up here, right? That's what it's called, this, this whole class. There's two classes here. There is this class, right? And this class. Well, this one is like almost like our program. That's what it is, right? And here, I'm actually in, uh, instantiating a new employee um, object, right? Here's my A worker, which is based off the employee class. And I'm sending into it with these curly braces, right? With these curly braces, this is the funny way of doing it now, an ID number, a named variable, right, of 101, okay? I'm naming the, uh, the identifier or the, 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 uh, the property, the class property that's in here in my employee class, right? I'm setting it automatically to 101, right? So even though my constructor is the empty constructor down here, see, down here, empty constructor, sorry to get out of your way, here, when I create my my uh, my object called a worker, right? Based off the employee class, I don't have a constructor inside my class that only takes ID number. However, if I specify the name within these curly braces, it allows me to create um, an employee. So this fires up here. This is an initializer in some ways as well, right? It fires before this thing fires. So this is triggered. Right? I assign ID number of 101 before my empty constructor is called. Right? Again, a different pattern. Right? When we see this, I'll tell you right now, I don't see a lot of this. It's less controlled. A lot of times I see named variables like this, named variables inside the constructor. That we do. Right? But typically we don't see a lot of this. It's a different construct. It's neat. Right? But a lot of times it goes outside of the rules of some programming languages that are C, <clears throat> that are C influenced, right? So will I test you on something like this? The answer is probably not. Okay. I want you guys to understand basics. This is not basics. This is like advanced constructor initializer kind of methodology. And you know, to me, it's like they mix in this way. The Deedle books are cool, the one that you have in your hand, or the one you're using. But sometimes some of the things they do, neat. Yes, but uh, why not? Cool. Yeah. See, see what I'm saying. So even though normally, how do we call it? How do we how do we create a new a new object? We have to use the parentheses, right? Well, there is no parentheses here. We're using curly braces, and these curly braces, what they're doing is they're creating, they're targeting the ID number, which is part of we somehow, even as a public a public uh, uh, property that we're targeting, right? They're all public properties now, if you notice, right? They have empty getter and setter methods so, so that their regular properties are just public, right? And all I'm doing is I'm saying make this ID number, target the ID number of 101, but then afterwards, because I'm not using my, my parentheses, I'm not even using the signature of any constructor that's in there, because this is the constructor and the, it's an empty constructor, which means I should be calling it with uh, parentheses that are empty inside, right? Before I call that one, assign the number, I, uh, this 101 literal, uh, integer literal to ID number. Right? Again, neat. It solves some issues, solves some problems. Not recommended. So if you see this pattern outside, right, and you look at it, this is what it is. I'm showing it to you, and the book is showing it to you, and I'm explaining it, but I'm not going to call upon you to make something like this, ever. Right? 
I'm not saying you're free to forget it or anything like that, um, but so just, just so you know what it does. So again, these are object initializers, all right? And it's like it says, it says, allows you to assign values to any accessible members or properties of a class at the time of instantiation without calling a constructor with parameters, okay? Why would I do that? There's so many other ways of, of assigning, um, of controlling and uh, information hiding, right? I would rather that I use some kind of set method, right, to initialize everything, right? Now this, what they're trying to do here is saying, hey, I don't, I want to initialize this thing before the constructor is called. Because maybe what I need to do is use the ID number when the constructor is called, but I can't decide what it is, and I don't want to pass it through the constructor. I don't know why. Why would you not want to pass that into the constructor, right? It's the same thing, actually. Why not create another, another signature that allows you to pass it into the constructor. That would be a better construct or uh, you know, way of doing things. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about uh, uh, object initializers because, uh, like I said before, I don't wholeheartedly agree with them, right? Um, but however, I want you to understand them. So here's a, an interesting uh, box class, height, width, and depth, right? And if you notice, each of these height, width, and depth when we call the constructor, the box class's constructor, also called box, it's an empty constructor that automatically initializes these three um, properties to one, right? And again, we're seeing this empty getter and setter pattern here. It doesn't have to be written this way. Like if you notice mine, I don't have that, right, in my class. And it works just fine, right? I could put them in, like I could do this, right? get, and then set. I could do that, right? Empty getter is instead. <clears throat> I could do that, right? But why would I? In fact, if anything, I mean, what you're, again, you're, you're specifying, um, and some people might say, well, there's more control, Tom, because then if you want to create a setter or getter, you could. Yeah, you could, but if I was going to create getters and setters, I would create a section in my class that has getters and setters section right, for all uh, sections that I would want to create getters and setters for, and I would specify each one. That makes more sense to me, right? So uh, the way we build programs, there's many ways to do this. And this is the thing with programming, with coding. You have many directions you can take. doesn't mean that you should take them, right? I'm trying to show you the right way to do it. The way I would do it, if, if, I, was, if I was your boss and you're working for a small uh, 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 independent developer company or whatever, an indie developer, and I would say, please don't do that. That makes no sense to me. If I'm doing a code review and I'm looking at your code, I'm going to say, be explicit, not implicit, wherever you can be. Right? Be explicit, which means define the actual things that you're trying to tell me to do. Don't let the code do it for you as much as possible, because the more you let the code run away with it, then you're going to get logic errors more logic errors, more things that, that happen automatically that you don't understand. Let me get rid of this uh, string, my string. And by the way, we've done a lot of things here, right? Um, I also talked about GitHub yesterday a little bit. I want to talk about that again. Um, I've done a bunch of changes to my car and my program class. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit these changes. So I'm going to say updated uh, <clears throat> car class and program main. So when I do a commit in GitHub, and we're going to learn GitHub kind of like as an aside, right? Um, some of you may want to take that little course that they're coming up with for GitHub, right? Um, but uh, what I'm doing when I commit is I create a snapshot of my code, right? Snapshot. And then I save it remotely, right? And I do that by going to home, unsync commits, and clicking sync. And when I do that, it sends a snapshot of my code online. So when I go back up to GitHub, yeah, okay, GitHub, and I go to the my repository that I just created, which is one, comp one two three less than three, I can see that my repository is updated with these three commits. The first one I made, these are snapshots, is my initial commit that's created by Visual Studio. The next one is created my course files, which I started working with. And then the, today, January 21st, different day, I updated my car class and my program main, which is snapshots or a revision history 
of everything that I do, which means I can revert back to one of these states if I need to, right? It's not, about, it's not just about uh, storing stuff on GitHub as a storage uh, container. It's about using GitHub as a um, source control or revision history. So if you notice what it says here, it says I can copy the full SS, uh, the uh, pattern. I can browse the code at the, this point in the history, or this point in the history, or this point in the history, right? And I can also revert back to a previous point. I can take my code back to that and make that the main uh, point. So if I go back to the first time I created my code files, I can see each each file and what their state was, right? These are all my properties and everything else. And here's my my car class when I first uh, saved everything yesterday, right? I'm driving forward. I don't have I don't have my show, right? My display class we created together. I don't have that. My display method it's not here, right? Because that was created here when I did this snapshot. And here are all the changes. It shows you the changes to all my code from one snapshot to the other. That's why GitHub is so cool. Um, so if you want to follow along with me and you don't know how what I did, you can always look on GitHub on a daily basis as we roll, and you can look inside the course files and see what I'm doing, right? So you can pull stuff down, test it yourself, and it should work. If it works for me, it should work for you, unless something's different in your configuration. Okay? Going back. So again, we got our, our car class and everything else. Um, I'm gonna, I've saved it to GitHub. I'm going to continue on with this. Uh, this PowerPoint for a little bit more, and then I'm going to talk about your your assignment number one a little bit. Okay, so here's some examples of that initializer. I've set the height, width, and depth, right? Here's the height, width, and depth without calling without calling the um, uh, the constructor. So what I'm doing is I'm actually going outside of the constructor. I'm actually initializing my my uh, my object without calling the constructor and that's what these object initializers allow me to do. So it's like saying I don't want to call the constructor I just want to set up the, the properties and, and set up these boxes box one two and three with my own custom heights widths and depths. So I want to do this before the constructor is called. So if you notice my height is set to three, my width is set to 15, my depth is set to 268 and so on. I don't, I don't recommend it. It's cause. It's a very nice place to cause confusion for you guys. You look at it and you're like, so what does that mean? What mean if I only set my height to three, and I still call my constructor later on? Does width and depth stay at one? And what happens? But I'm calling. I'm telling my in my constructor. I'm saying I'm setting my height to one. Is it three or is it one? Well, unfortunately, it's three, right? It's again a cause for some confusion. For confusion. So I don't recommend using object initializers. But I do recommend that you understand what they are. I won't be testing you on it, and they won't be on any exam that I make. All right? So just let you know, just to be fair. Okay. This is cool. Overloading op operators we need to talk about. Again, what we want to do is um, we want to make some special operators, if you will, that work only as the type of operators that work in your code. All right? So it says, enables you to use arithmetic uh, symbols with your own objects. So if I want to add two objects together, like car and paint, maybe they're two different objects, and I want to kind of smash them together and add them together somehow, the two values are put together. Almost like, remember I told you, you can only have one class that your, other, your class can, and I, maybe I didn't say this last week uh, or the yesterday, uh, only one class that your the new class is being derived from. But what our overloading, op overloading operators allows you to do is smash two things together. All right? Let me see what I... I'll tell you what it, how it looks in a second. Um, let me just give you an example. I think the example is a better way of looking at it. Okay, so here's... Here's... Uh, if you look at this highlighted block here, I've got my public static book. Right? Here's my book class. I'm creating my public static book operator. I'm using the operator keyword. Plus... And what is it taking? It's taking first and second, right? First and second, these two variables, this book, and it's taking basically two books. Okay. So imagine I've instantiated, and because it's static, this is a great example of where a static 
construct is good to use across all objects, right? I'm creating a new operator, right? And I want every single construct to say, if I take two objects that are made from this class, these are the parameters, the first book and the second book. What I want to do is I want to use my plus operators. When I say book, my first book and my second book, put them together, right? There's going to be this stuff that's going to happen. So I'm going to declare a constant, double extra is 10 bucks, right? I'm going to, uh, or 10. Uh, I'm going to put a new title, which is my first title and my second title added together. I'm going to say my page count is going to be added together. I'm putting two books together, right? Uh, my, my price is going to be my new price, which is the extra, um, <clears throat> which I'm getting, right? My double and new price. I'm declaring a double. I should actually be declaring this up here. All, again, best practice, declare all your variables at the top of your methods and the top of your classes. So we can see them as much as possible, right? Because it, it, it kind of reduces problems. So here I'm declaring a method, uh, sorry, a property called, and a local, local variable called new price. Right? And then I'm saying if first price is greater than second price, well then the new price is, is the first price plus the extra 10 bucks. That's what it is. Otherwise, new price is equal to the second price plus the extra 10 bucks. And then return, this is the return, right? Because every uh, operator has a default return, it has to have that, is a new, you're instantiating a new anonymous object Right? A new anonymous object with a title and pages and price of these two books put together. Very complex crap. All right? If you haven't seen this stuff before, you're going to look at it and go, what the hell? Right? I understand it because what I'm doing is I'm creating an operator that's, that's listening for two uh, uh, different um, uh, in objects or instances of the book class, which hasn't even been created yet. The way I'm going to think, would this be code for software for a cash register of some sort at a bookstore with some sort of sale on and it takes, maybe you can get two books, the second one is $10, and so it's $10 plus the cost of the more expensive book. Is that what this is? Kind of. Okay. To me, but, but again, I think it's a bad example. Um, I think I would rather say it like this. Let's say, for example, I want to mutate. I want to mutate an existing object, right? So I have an object, human, and I want to cause them to become a mutant, right? Well, maybe I have a mutant, right? A different kind of, some extra properties that my mutant class would have. Like, let's say, for example, I'm trying to think of how to make this happen. I want to make you into a superhero, right? There's a couple ways for it to happen, right? In real life. And I'll, follow me here for a second. I'm going to digress, right? I can irradiate you with gamma, gamma rays to make you into the Hulk, right? I can pass you through some kind of special energy fields, right? I can give you a super soldier formula to make you into a, into a, human, a superhuman, right? Well, when I do this, all I'm using is the plus operator. If you think about it, I have a human, that's my class, plus my superhuman formula, right? That I'm smashing together, and now my, the properties, they have to be identical, because they have to be the, two of the same kind of... Th a superhuman and a human are just different humans, right? A superhuman, but I'm going to give you different abilities. I'm going to take the abilities of the superhuman, maybe more strength and speed and everything else, and put it on top of my human. It's going to basically assign these abilities. It's going to smash them together inside of my operator. And I, can, I have full control over what my, my plus operator is going to do. So if I say human plus this super soldier formula, which is actually just another human, it's going to make this human into a super soldier. Right? And this is the only reason why you'd want to smash these two classes together. But this is a great example of a mix-in, right? Where I have, I want, to, I want to call it more of a mix-in, because I have two fragments, right? I have two classes, two objects that are of the same class, and I want to add these two things together for some reason, right? It's almost like if I want to create my own data type, I can use the plus operator with a string, and I can use the plus operator with integers, right? But I have to define that. Imagine if you're creating some kind of weird new data type, but you want to be able to define what the plus operator does for this this object. If you don't define it, the plus operator has no meaning for the objects, right? So in this particular case, when you define a plus operator, or any kind of operator, you define what it does. If I take two, op op uh, two objects and I put a, uh, some kind of uh, asterisk between them, I'm multiplying them somehow, right? Well then, you have to define what the multiplication does, and this is what it allows you to do. Advanced. 
will I ask you for this in, a, in, a, in an exam, right? Or will I, will I get you to do this in an assignment? No, I will not. This is advanced crap, right? And it's, it's, it's nice. I like it. Not necessary for you to understand at this level. This is one thing I do like, by the way. This is really cool. It's the only reason why I would use any static properties or any static uh, methods or operators. <clears throat> so all we're doing is called operator overloading, right, or overloading operators. And you can do it for any kind of operator. Here's the example now where I have two books, Silas Marner and Moby Dick, right, with uh, page count and, uh, and all this kind of stuff in the price. And what I'm doing is I'm putting these two books together to create a super book, right? One big book with the both titles, Silas Marner and Moby Dick. Right, and I'm taking the book, this third book, which is book three. I'm defining a book three as of a type of book, but I haven't instantiated it yet. I haven't done that, and I don't need to do it because the instantiation happens here with this new keyword that's inside of my operator. And remember, look, there is no. I haven't named this book. Right, this new book has no name. Usually, we have a the name of the book, right? So my book is equal to new book. My book is my alias for this new object, right? But there is no alias for this new object. So we call this an, an anonymous object. We're creating an anonymous object and we're returning the anonymous object and assigning it to book three. So book three is of type book because we've defined it as a book. Because remember, when we make these new objects, and I'm going fast here, I apologize. We make these new objects they are a different data type. They're our own custom data type, right? They're an object of type book, right? But I haven't, I haven't instantiated an object. This object is a reference. It says book three has the book shape, but I haven't created it yet, right? It's just a reference to it, right? And I can do that. I can create my objects like this without using the new keyword, right? My objects aren't created. They're just reference. They're referencing the book type, right? Just like if I create a string, and I don't instantiate it, I don't initialize the string, I don't give it a value, it has the null value. So too with the book with book three, if I tried to use a console.write line to print it out. It doesn't have a value right now. Right? When I take these two books and add them together though, with the plus overloaded plus operator, I can get the new title for book three, which is a combination of Silas Marner and Moby Dick, as we see here, because it takes the two titles and adds them together right, in this plus operator method. Whew. Like I said, stuff that's a little advanced, I don't expect you to remember. Uh, it's neat. I won't test you on it on the final exam or on your test coming up. Same thing with a minus, where there's two book prices, one book, you minus the other one somehow. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, but here's one thing that really does make sense. How about if I want to make an array of objects, right? This is cool. So if you notice, just like we make other arrays, because my new object is a data type, right? My object is employee, right here. I want to make an array of employees, and I want to say, I want to declare seven employees. Well, what did this do? I've actually created seven uh, anonymous objects, right? Uh, they're not named objects of type employee that I'm assigning to each index in my array, right? So this goes back to the whole idea of anonymous objects as opposed to named objects. A named object, right? Let's go back. It looks like this. Book, book one is equal to new book. Book one is the name for the object, right? An anonymous object, right? It looks like this, right? New employee. Right, where this is the name of the array, but each of the objects that are contained within the array, right, as an example, are anonymous objects. They're just indexed with the array number. The, the, they're, mem they're in memory locations. Each object has its own memory location, but they're contained within the array. This is very powerful because imagine now I want to create multiple employees or multiple enemies, or, and I want to update each one of them. Right? It's a very, very powerful methodology here. And then I can cycle through them by using the length of the employee array to cycle through them and declare them a new employee. Right? So each one of them, can I, I can declare, I can instantiate 
and make it a new employee. So here I'm saying my array is an array of seven elements. Here I'm actually assigning it. I'm creating it each time. Tricky if you've never seen it before. This you will be tested on, but we'll do it later. So we'll see, we'll see it again and again. I'm going to stop, right, because I think we've done more than enough. I'm going to probably hit some of this next uh, week as well before we get into the, the um, uh, inheritance piece. I do want to talk for about five minutes about your assignment because I think we need to do that. I'm not gonna, I don't want to kill you with this stuff because some of it you're like, how does this make any sense? My brain is overloaded. You just cut my head off and just keep pouring stuff in, right? And yeah, it's like that in some ways. So that's why I, want, I don't want to keep doing it to you. All right, so I'm asking you to create a hero class. What are the properties? Strength, speed, health, and name. Each one of them has a type. Int, 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 strength. Right? Make sense? And also, I've defined, I've made you define four methods or five methods, right? I haven't talked about the constructor method in here, right? I talk about the constructor down here, right? I say my private properties, so I mention which ones are private. Strength, speed, health. I don't mention them up here, the access modifiers. I could have, but I told you my private properties are strength, speed, and health. If you define them, you get three marks. That's pretty simple, guys, right? My public properties are, as a name, you get one mark, okay? I didn't tell you to, to initialize it or anything, all right? The constructor method, which we just talked about at length, should take only one parameter, name, which is a string, and pass its value to the name property. How do we do that? The, this keyword, right? Uh, to the name property. It would also call the generate abilities method. Here's the generate abilities method. We haven't made it yet, right? Two marks. Two what? Two marks for each. Each line tells you. Each line tells you where your marks are coming from. One C, two marks. Yeah. Constructor method. You, yeah. The cutter method takes two, two. Has two marks. One is for taking the name string and passing it to the name property, and the other one is calling the generate abilities method. That's how I'm breaking it out. So there's two methods. There's two marks for these for this method for this constructor method. There's only one constructor method, one constructor method, but I'm calling the generate abilities method within the constructor the constructor method. I'm just calling it right. That's what I'm saying. Call the the generate abilities method. The number one is I want to make a new private generate abilities method, the one I'm calling, that randomly generates the ability numbers for the strength, speed, and health properties. We did random, right? We talked about random last week. Math dot random. Right, just like we do in other languages. And we use the next. I kind of went over that last week with you. Each ability would be an integer between 1 and 100. How do I do an integer between 1 and 100? I generate, uh, and I want to do one for each ability, right? It's a random number between 1 and 100. That's all it is. And I'm, I'm assigning these things to my properties with the this keyword, right? I'm telling you how to do this thing, all right, if you listen carefully. Um, I'm going to make a public fight method. I probably should highlight this in black. The fight method calls a hit attempt method, and if the hit attempt returns true, so it has a return value, right, true or false, then it will call the hit damage method. Okay, so that means like this. This is the, con the construct that we're talking about. If hit attempt is equal to true, then you're going to call the, the hit damage method, and you're going to assign the hit damage method to some kind of damage result that you're going to print out. It says that right here. The damage will then be displayed in a message on the console. So you're going to say, you're going to make a local variable called damage for this particular fight method. It's not something we need to save. And we're going to say damage is equal to hit damage if and only if the hit attempt was successful. So if hit attempt is equal to true, and you calculate your hit attempt by your hit attempt method, right? Your hit attempt method is going to say it will randomly determine if the hero hits. This should be 20% of the time. How do I say it's 20% of the time? I got to check if the number is between 1 and 20 on a, from one, 1 to 100. So I generate a random result from 1 to 100, and I say if my result is between 1 and 20, it hits. Return true, right? If it's between 21 and, eight and, uh, and 100, it misses. Return false, right? So if my hit attempt is false. Private. Hit damage. A method that calculates the damage the hero causes to the target, whatever the target is, I haven't even specified that. 
uh, on a hit. The damage will be calculated by multiplying the hero's strength property by a number between 1 and 6. Right? So that means if the, strength guy, if the guy's strength is 10, and you do a random number between 1 and 6, if it's 2, now he does 20 damage. Right? We'll go over this again next week. Don't worry. Right? After you've done all this, you've created your class. We haven't implemented it yet. We just created the class. Right? Here's the implementation here. In your main method, implement the hero class by creating a new hero object. So my hero is equal to new hero. Right? It's pretty loud. <clears throat> and um, have the hero called the show method, hero.show, my hero.show. Right? And then have the hero called the fight method, my hero.fight. And you're done with this piece. That's four marks. Right? And then here's something that I'm giving you some extra marks for. Um, and this piece too for GitHub, we'll talk about this. Right? Six marks for your internal documentation, which includes I want your name on your class. So like let's say a little header, a little comment header that shows your name, your your date modified. I modified it on the 21st of January, whatever, 2015. Uh, my program description, my program is about a hero class. I make a hero. <laughs> Whatever, right? My revision history, um, so you say my first revision, just go through the, the commit history and you go, my first revision I did this, I built the class, my second, and you might, you might say version 1, version 2, version 3, whatever you want to put. We'll go over that next week again. And your GitHub is, we're going to have to do a connection. I want to show you how to do a connection with GitHub, right, for you to get full marks here. If you just put your files onto GitHub, two marks. If you use your files with GitHub, yeah, you get the other two marks. Okay. Bonus marks. If you do anything extra with the, 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 the hero class, above and beyond what I've asked for, I will consider bonus marks. And by the way, this is wrong on your copy online. It should only be 5%. This would be 10%. So this, this, uh, this assignment, and although it may seem complex, is not complex. All I've done is I've broken it out. Each line does something. It tells you what to do, right? Follow each of the instructions. If you have some, if there's some ambiguity as to what to do, if you don't understand what the instruction means, come Tuesday, ask me. Right? So if you say, Tom, I don't know what you mean by well, when you say the constructor method should take one parameter. That means the constructor should be called hero, and it takes one parameter of type string that's called name. I'm not going to write it for you, but I want you to understand when I say it, this is the first time we're doing an assignment together, so it's only worth 5%, and we're going to do many assignments, like four or five of them, right? So you're going, to have the, you're going to see them in the same way over and over again, right? I want you, this is your homework for next week, even though your, your assignment one is not due, it is not due until Friday, I want you to try and get it prepared as much as possible, as full as you can, by Tuesday, right? So when we meet together on Tuesday, Let's look it over together so you can get 100%. I'm okay with all of you getting 100%. That means I want to see something. If you don't have anything ready, I can't help you. If you've got something ready, we can talk about it. So please be ready for Tuesday. Okay? And that's it for me.